Thank you. Cheers. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to speak to you um, about sea level rise and data science. Uh, my name is Andrew Parnell. I'm from the Hamilton Institute in uh, Maynooth University. So we live in a bizarre quandary at the moment where data has never been more available. The analysis techniques that we can use have never been richer, and yet facts seem so sparse and thin on the ground. We seem to have so many disagreements. Uh, and climate change seems to be uh, emblematic of that problem. You'd think, given the size of the data sets and the processing power that we have, um, given that we've known about the greenhouse effect now for over 150 years, this should be uh, um, a kind of a settled science and a, a consensus should be building, but traditionally that hasn't happened. Um, we've, we've spent far too much time arguing over, over details of facts which, which are uh, more or less decided now. Having said that, I've kind of noticed in the last few years that things have changed a little bit. Certainly in the media, things are getting much more uh, sensibly reported these days, and it kind of feels as though we've moved beyond that kind of controversy um, uh, issue, and we're, we're kind of uh, converging to, to making some kind of action about this, this problem. I'm not going to speak about climatology generally, I'm going to speak about something which I know quite a lot about, which is um, sea level rise. And I'm going to start... Uh, with a, with a picture that comes from a paper from, from 2011 where they, um, it's just data, they just averaged all of the global tide gauges. There's hundreds of them out there. Some of them go back 50, 60 years. Some of them go back a little bit further. The details of how you average it is, is quite complicated. But what my research group do is um, they use Bayesian methods and, and lots of Gaussian processes to try and merge these kind of data sets together from multiple different sources and try and estimate rates of change of sea level rise with uncertainty. And so this is a global tide gauge data set. It goes back to 1880. The paper was published in 2011, but they updated it, so we've now got data up to, to 2014. Um, and you can see there, in 1880, the rate was about 1.2 millimeters per year. And if I set this graph running forward, you can see that rate at the top there. As sea level starts to rise, you can see that rate changing 1.3, 1.4 millimeters per year. Um, you'll see that it's not constant. It goes up and it goes down. Um, and in fact, if you start to average over the entire 20th century, you get a rate of about 1.7 millimeters per year. Uh, and there's a little trick you can do in your head. If you multiply that number by 10, that's uh, the amount of centimeters you'll see in a century. And that's often how people like to work with these. So you can see it's around about 1.7 millimeters per year. And then just before the year 2000, it starts to shoot up. We start to hit two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four, four and a half millimeters per year. So up to 45 centimeters of, of, uh, of sea level rise uh, across the century. Uh, and that's a bit worrying. And in fact, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change think it's going to get worse than that because they think the, the rise, that, that, um, that rate of rise is actually going to increase and we're going to see something between 70 centimeters and, and 100 centimeters um, uh, as, as by the time we hit the end of the century, uh, which, which is a pretty, pretty big problem. But I realize this talk is in the afternoon, straight after lunch, and everybody's starting to fall asleep and feel a bit uh, sleepy. So let's play a little game. There's a building in the center of this picture. It's got a kind of serrated staircase type edge. Does anyone know what that building is? No? OK, I'll zoom out a little bit. That building is still there. It's got a little bit smaller. So do you want to know where we are? We're in New York, yes. If I zoom out a little bit further, building's still in the center there. Anyone care to guess now what that building is? It's Trump Tower. Okay. Trump Tower, most annoyingly, is 14 meters above sea level. So he is not about to get hit anytime soon uh, by, by sea level rise, at least on Manhattan Island. But then I discovered that um, one of the journalists at BuzzFeed had actually looked at all of Trump's properties and had worked out which ones would start to be affected the soonest. And if you remember from my two slides ago, you're getting about uh, 70 to 100 centimeters. That's about three feet um, in sea level rise. And if you look at these very closely, you see they all start to get affected once you get to up to about two meters. But I think it's Trump Hollywood there that really uh, 
starts to, starts to get hit first. Uh, so maybe at some point when it starts to hit his bottom line, he'll actually change his mind about some of the science about this stuff. Sea level science in the US is actually very well funded. I have a number of collaborators who work over there and specifically in New York. So we can do the same kind of thing that people do for the global tide gauges, for, but for New York. Um, and this is the graph that you get here. And because we've had quite a lot of funding here, we can combine satellite information, we can combine tide gauges, we can combine um, more ancient information from, from uh, organisms which are stored in the soil, which tell us about past sea level as well. And so in New York, we're actually able to go back over 1,500 years to try and work out what sea level is doing. And again, as I play this forward, it's now going up every 10 years, you'll see this kind of like this average background rate of rise that's almost always there. This is an inevitable, unfortunate fact about sea level rise. Because we're still coming out of the last glaciation, because land level movements are still changing, um, you will still see always this background sea level rise uh, going on. But as you start to get closer to um, the present, as you see, we're going to hit about that 1.2 millimeters. You'll start to see exactly what we saw um, in the, in the global series. As you start to hit into the 20th century, you'll start to see it creeping up. You start to hit above two millimeters per year. And when we finish this study in the, um, in, I think the last rate is 2012, you can see we've already hit that three millimeters per year. This is starting to accelerate as well. The more recent information puts it at three and a half to four millimeters per year. Again, use your little rule of thumb, that translates into 40 centimeters per century. And the headline figure here is that there's $25 billion worth of infrastructure below one meter above present sea level in New York. So this is a really urgent problem, um, and pe people are uh, quite rapidly looking at this um, as it goes through. This really, the subtitle for this talk could have been A Tale of Two Cities. So we have New York, which is a fascinating and interesting place to work uh, on sea level rise. But the other amazing city to work in right now is Dublin, because almost nobody knows anything about what's actually happening to sea level rise in Dublin. There's so much of, our, of the land around here which is reclaimed from the sea, which is very, very close um, to sea level. Big chunks of, of the back of Trinity College are all under sea level, have all been reclaimed from the sea. And anybody who's, who's been around Sandy Mount as well will, um, will have seen something similar. So in the center of this picture, uh, over towards the back, there is, there is a little, very ancient building called the Pigeon House, which has a tide gauge in it. And there's another one in Dublin Port, which actually has a much longer record. And people are just starting to look at that. And again, we can use the same methods as we go through. The Dublin Port tide gauge is absolutely crazy if you look at it. So it's much more uncertain, it's much noisier than the other ones, and the kinds of rates of change you see as you go through are much greater. So you see already in the early, in the 50s and the 60s, you're still getting three millimeter rises. Then you're actually getting drops as you go down. It's going down to below seven millimeters per year. But then again, exactly like in the global series, exactly like in New York, you're starting to see just before the year 2000, it starts to go absolutely crazy. It starts to hit rates, and you'll see them as they come up in a second, three, five, 10, 13, 15 millimeters per year. Um, and this is right on uh, the spot where all of those wonderful fancy new buildings are being uh, constructed left, right, and center. Nobody really knows whether to trust this data set or not at the moment. We don't really like doing stuff on just one tide gauge by itself. We like to have other information in there. We like to have satellites. We like to have other stuff that's going on. This is just one tide gauge, and nobody's really sure if we trust it. I'd be amazed if the sea level was rising in Dublin Port at 10, 15 millimeters per year. But also, I would be surprised if it's much less than three or four or five, because that's what the global average is doing. And we have a real problem in uh, how we're going to maintain the sustainability of the city if that kind of thing is, is actually occurring. So the government released its Climate Action Plan uh, 2019. <laughs> it's 150 pages long. It mentions sea level rise four times, and each time it just says sea level is rising, <laughs> which isn't great. Luckily, 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 the individual local authorities have released their own Climate Action Plan. And if you read at least the Dublin City Council one, that's really good. It, it's got, it's, it's got, the whole thing is pretty much about sea level rise. Hasn't got a huge amount of solutions as to what they're going to do about it. And they also call into question what's actually going on with this, this Dublin port tide gauge. Why is it rising three times faster than the, than the global average? But there is at least hope that something might be done um, about this. But having said that, that's just about Dublin. 
there's still so much we don't know. The big global question right now in sea level rise, which we're all working on, is acceleration. How fast is the rise in sea level rising? Are we going to level out by 2100 at about a meter, or is it going to be much higher? And there are all kinds of issues with this. There's the huge volumes of data. We need data scientists. We need methods to, to amalgamate those different data sets. They all have different resolutions and different complexity. They're absolutely massive. Then you've got, um, you've got issues with um, what comes with sea level rise as well. So a 30 or a 40 centimeter sea level rise doesn't sound that bad, but what often happens when sea level rises is that the tidal range starts to increase as well. And that means you get increased flooding. And then if you get rainfall and storms, when the tides are higher, you get more increased extreme flooding as well. Uh, and then you start to, to run into all kinds of problems. And again, because there's more energy in the system, you end up with sediment movement as well. And so the, the, the whole shape of Dublin Bay and, uh, can actually change. This is all we know about Dublin. We have so little information about the rest of Ireland. We really, really don't know very much. There's a few other tide gauges knocking around the place. We have some wave models. We have some satellite information. But our job now is really to do a much better job. So much of the natural resources and the amazing sites around Ireland are on the coast. And we need to protect those. So to finish off, what we're working on is trying to just capture what the present state is in terms of sea level rise and whether it's accelerating in the future. We, we need to get that going. The problem we have, and this is where you can start to help and, and um, advocate for us, is in terms of funding. We get small amounts of funding from the Marine Institute and from the Environmental Protection Agency, but currently the largest funding source comes from Science Foundation Ireland, and their remit from the government is to fund stuff which directly impacts the economy. And traditionally, that has meant they have not funded much in the area of climate change. Of all of these huge Science Foundation Island research centers which are about, none of them are really focused on, on climate change. And so for that, we need people who work in companies, especially people who control budgets, and especially people who work in big multinational co corporations who care about sustainability, who care about this kind of stuff, to nag SFI, to put funding towards this kind of research so we can work out what is actually happening to sea level rise in the future. And if you want to chat to me about that, I'd be delighted. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Andy. That was a fascinating talk um, and really quite a, quite a pertinent topic you know, these days. And really your message at the end there was uh, quite significant. And the funding does need to, need to start coming in for, for this kind of research. Um, so just a quick question. Uh, I have many questions. <laughs> Could keep you here all day. Um, but you mentioned that there is um, an innate background sea level rise um, coming from the glacial period. And I'm just wondering, like, is it simple to quantify how much us, the human activity is actually accounting for this sea level rise and that increase, that acceleration that we see? It's really hard because um, sea level is, is a slow-moving thing. It's very hard to stop once it's started, and the contributions are from lots of different sources. You've got just the amount of water in the ocean, you've got ice coming off, you've got land level movements from, from the last glaciations. Mm. We kind of have a background rate of around one to one and a half millimeters a year, which is kind of the standard thing that, that most, most corrections are, are taken off from the sea level rise. So anything above that is usually ascribed to, to human influence. <laughs> We're at fault, essentially, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. We'll just thank Andrew again. Thank you. For a wonderful talk. Thank you. Take that off, yeah. okay.